There we go. Uh, that's, that works a little better. We want to welcome you to Bethany Christian Church as we celebrate 196 years of serving God together as a congregation. Now think about the number of lives that have been touched over the course of 196 years of ministry by the people who have been part of Bethany Christian Church. The number of people who've been baptized into Christ. The number of people who have lived out Jesus' command to demonstrate our love for God by showing love for others. Now, we saw an example of that just this week as so many of you brought supplies to help out with the relief efforts from the hurricane on such short notice. Less than an hour after we sent out the, the notice that the truck was going to be here to collect relief items, we had people showing up with water and, and other supplies in, in less than an hour. And, uh, it, it, and many of you have brought even more to, to load up with the truck uh, after the fellowship lunch today, and we're grateful for that. And in your bulletin, you have, uh, you have several Christian organizations that are on the ground in areas affected by uh, Hurricane Helene and are helping in the recovery efforts there. And we strongly encourage you to be generous in supporting the work that is being done in the name of Christ. Uh, and as we begin today, I, I want us to make that our prayer focus. We're going to have a time, uh, a moment, where, in, in just a moment, where, where you're going to have some time to pray silently. And I'm going to ask that you would pray for those who've lost loved ones, uh, homes, businesses, and, and more from this storm. Uh, pray for the recovery efforts and those who've been working to find stranded people, as well as those doing repair work and distributing supplies. And so uh, I'm gonna ask at this time if we have a moment uh, of silent prayer where as you pray for those things, and then I'll close uh, our time of prayer together. So let, let's pray together silently. Father, we've been shocked by the amount of devastation we've seen in the wake of this storm. The loss that so many have felt it is just beyond the ability we have to wrap our minds around. And it's overwhelming. And so overwhelming that it could be hard to even know where to start with our prayers. But for those who've lost loved ones, Lord, we pray for comfort and strength. For those struggling to survive, we pray that you would guide the search and rescue efforts to find them quickly. And Father, for, we lift up those who, who have volunteered their time and money and skills and equipment to help their neighbors. Lord, I pray that all of those efforts, including the ones by folks here donating supplies and other places donating supplies and supporting recovery ministries, will not only provide help to those who need it, but will bring glory to you through the love being poured out in your name. Lord, may it spark revival and unity in our country that needs both so much right now. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And when God told Moses to go and lead his people out of Egypt, Moses said, well, what if they ask who sent me? What if they ask your name? Well, what do I tell them then? And God said this. He said, I am who I am. Say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Now, I am might sound like a strange name to 21st century ears, but to his people, it was a full, rich term demonstrating God's nature as eternal, always there, always present. It means that before creation, he existed. When his people were in slavery in Egypt, he was present with them. 
in Jesus, he was Emmanuel, God with us. 196 years ago, when this particular congregation of God's people formed, he was among them. And today, as we gather to worship, he is still I am. He is still present with us. And he is worthy of our praise. So let's stand together and worship him together.
that song it talks about how great God is that he puts the very breath in our lungs and we can trust in him because he's all that we need in John 8 Jesus told the people who were listening to him before Abraham was even born I am in other words he's our creator he's our sustainer and he's our savior we trust in him because he's all that we ever need in life. He's given us life. And when we sin and brought the sentence of death on ourselves, he brought us new life. He sacrificed himself so that we could live. And that's what we celebrate as we take the bread and the cup this morning. In just a moment, the trays are going to be passed and there will be two cups stacked. Uh, one with the bread that reminds us of his body that was beaten and broken for us, the other with the juice that, that reminds us of the blood that he shed for us. And you can take them and you can hold them as they're passed. You'll have time to meditate and pray. And we invite everyone who's a follower of Christ to join us in that. If you've never been baptized into him, then I encourage you to let the tray pass and meditate on the scripture that will be on the screen and consider the incredible love that Jesus has for you that he demonstrated on the cross. Let's pray again. Father, you demonstrated such incredible love. 
love that we know we're unworthy of. But we are grateful. As we come to this time of remembrance this morning, we thank you for Jesus and his sacrifice for us. And we pray that you would bless us as we take the bread and the cup, that we would be reminded of Jesus' love. And then that we would be prompted to share that love with those who don't know him. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. While the kids are making their way to their class, let me remind you of a couple of things coming up. Most immediate of which is our fellowship lunch after the worship service today over in the gym. I encourage you to stay and be a part of that. If you didn't bring anything, don't worry about it. There's more than enough. And, uh, and I will sacrifice my vegetables <laughs> for you. So just relax and, and join us. Join us for, for lunch uh, in just a little bit. A um, couple of things that, that, that are coming up. Uh, I just I want you to read your bulletin because I'm not going to go through everything that's there. But the, the ministry leaders, please make sure you get your budgets to, uh, to um, Bonnie uh, by tomorrow. Um, skate land for, for youth and adults uh, this week. Next Sunday is the harvest party. And Carol asked me if, if we still need a few cakes for the cake walk candy if you'd be willing to bring that and then some more volunteers she's got a few spots that are still open uh we just we want to make this a, a great afternoon to invite the community next sunday afternoon uh, october 20th the youth are going hiking there's information in the bulletin about that and you may have noticed a, a qr code in your bulletin it's because we have uh, now an additional way that you can give uh, in addition to what we, we just did this way, we now have the, the ability to, to give online. And uh, one of the great things about this is that uh, unlike a lot of other platforms, the church gets 100% of your donation uh, with, with the, this service. And uh, so uh, if you want to take advantage of that, you are welcome to. Uh, but you don't have to do it that way, but that the other new way that's available if you would like. Well, I was going to do a bio and introduce you to our speaker today, but uh, a lot of you knew him before you even knew me. So I'm just going to dispense with that because not only did you get to know him through that, he probably told some stories about me when I wasn't here to defend myself. And the nice thing is, if he tells any more today, 
I have a rebuttal next week. <laughs> and you won't be here to hear it, but I'll send you a recording. Uh, because we do record it. Uh, but I am not going to take up uh, his time with all that because many of you have already are already somewhat familiar with him, but I'm going to encourage Wayne to come and share God's word with us this morning. They were stories, they were all true. <laughs> Contrary to some of your thinking, I was not the minister 196 years ago. <laughs> it's great to be with you again. Uh, it's been a few years since uh, I shared with you from uh, from this full bit, and uh, uh, I appreciate the opportunity to do that today. Now, Stan's quite a guy. He asked me if I would do this, and I said, I gotta think about that, uh, uh, because after driving across the country and all, I didn't know what, how it would feel. But then I said, yeah, and he threw in a caveat. He said, if you do it, I'll treat you to lunch. <laughs> what a guy, what a guy. Let's, <laughs> uh, Turn to Acts chapter 1, verses 6 through 11. And we're going to read that, but we're not going to talk about that much. Uh, I just want to set the stage for what uh, uh, will be my conclusion, really. I, I, yeah. The opening scripture is my conclusion. So that's, but there's a lot in between, believe me. Although I have been told to not let the food get cold. <laughs> Acts chapter 1, verses 6 through 11. So when they came together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time that you're restoring the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or the epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all of Judea and Samaria, and even to the remotest part of the world. And after he said these things, he was lifted up while they were looking up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And as they were gazing intently into the sky while he was going, behold, two men in white clothing stood beside them. They also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in just the same way as you have watched him go up into heaven. That's great. Father, we praise you today for the life that you give us. Uh, the life that gives us the opportunity to serve you. A uh, life that gives us the opportunity to be a part of your kingdom here on earth. Not just something that we look forward to one day, but we actually get to be a part. And Lord, today is... Uh, uh, we celebrate the uh, anniversary of, of this one congregation. Uh, we realize that we have people meeting around the world in your name. And Father, we just pray for that. Be with us this morning. Be with me as I try to uh, uh, impart your message. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. If you try to choose the most important event in the New Testament, what would it be? Yeah, yeah, I get a lot, we get a lot of different answers on that. And in my opinion, it would be impossible. Because to choose the most important event would be very difficult. <laughs> Because there's so many. Certainly we could start it off with the birth of Jesus. It's hard to top that. But we could go on to the, the, the messages that he taught for the years uh, that he was on earth. We could go to the examples that he gave in the life that he lived, never wavering from his mission. We could go to the crucifixion, the resurrection, the ascension. All of these things. So I can't choose the most important one event. 
But I can tell you the most important 50 day period in the New Testament. And that would be from the Passover to Pentecost. When he closed the old covenant and established the new. When, and if, if you read the, uh, you know, I can't read that box in here, the glare is getting that, uh, when, when he closed the old covenant and established the new covenant, that would be that time frame. Because in between those days, and, and, and I challenge you this week to read uh, John uh, thir chapters 13 through 18. John covers things that the in detail that the rest of the gospel writers didn't cover in detail. And one of the reasons is John knew what they had written by the time he got around to writing his. So uh, there are a lot of things that John didn't cover that they covered. But boy, he goes into detail. And, and John 13 starts with the Passover meal, the Lord's Supper being instituted, and, and then uh, and a myriad of things that uh, uh, John covers that Jesus did, and he goes into detail. And, and so I challenge you to read 13 through 18 at one time, and then sit down and, and go through the chapters individually, and, and spend some time thinking about how he had uh, took that time to teach the things that we're going to be looking at some of those today. But that 50 day period, Passover to Pentecost, when Jesus was crucified, resurrected, ascended, and the church was established. All of those events combined provide one access to eternal life with him beginning the day you become a Christian. And then, to the indwelling spirit here on earth. We teach these things, but sometimes we may not emphasize the ascension or the indwelling spirit quite as much as we do the crucifixion and the resurrection. So this morning we're going to take our time to look up a little bit more uh, into those events. We're going to look at the things that Jesus' ascension made possible. Jesus said that he had gone to prepare a place for us in the format that God chose in this creation. Jesus couldn't do that from earth. So it was vitally important. In John 14, he says in my, uh, chapter, uh, verse 2, uh, he says, In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If we're not so, I would have told you. If I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again to receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you may be also. So the ascension enabled Jesus to go and prepare a place for each one of us. For a day. Also, he couldn't Send the indwelling spirit until he had ascended. Uh, again, in John chapter 14, uh, <coughs> excuse me, verses uh, 16 and 26, he said, I will ask the Father, and he will send you another helper, that he may be with you forever. But the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring. Uh, to your remembrance, all that I said and did. He couldn't do that on earth because, again, the format that God chose, he couldn't believe, be in two places at one time. Now, his power could extend because we know he healed from a distance, but he was limited in time and space while he was here on earth. So the ascension made it possible for him to do those things that he couldn't get done here. It allowed him to complete the glorification process that started with the resurrection and to be united with his father. Let's read John chapter 17. And in this is Jesus' prayer. What uh, we call the Lord's Prayer, that which he teaches in, in Matthew and Luke. 
But this is the, the prayer that Jesus so intently gave with the uh, uh, apostles uh, during that uh, uh, time from the Passover meal until he gave himself. Remember, they didn't take it. He gave himself to be crucified for us. John 17, 4 and 5, Jesus says, I have glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work which you have given me to do. Now, Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory that I had with you before the world was. So the ascension allowed Jesus to complete the glorification process, which for him had begun at the resurrection and completed when he ascended, completing the opportunity to glorify God while he was here on earth and be united with him. And that glorification process was completed at that time. What a day. His work was completed and he was glorified with the Father where he had been prior to his time on earth. What a day. All of this set the stage for the ultimate homecoming. I love homecoming. But boy, we've got one to look forward to. That tops even one that celebrates 196 years. All of these things set the stage for the ultimate one. Now we're going to look at things that the glorification made possible. The church was established 10 days after the ascension and, and uh, at, at Pentecost, and it solidified or consummated the new covenant. The new covenant began when? When Jesus was resurrected. The old covenant was completed at that time because it took the death of the, uh, of the testator to, uh, for the old covenant to be uh, complete, uh, complete. And the new covenant began, but it hadn't been very active during that period of time. But it was consummated on the day of Pentecost. When what happened? The message was preached. And 3,000, so that sounds like a lot, but considering that that may have been a couple million people around, uh, it, it, it was small in number, percentage-wise. But it was the great beginning. A beginning that has grown through many difficulties through the years but is now preached on every continent around the world and will continue until the Lord comes. Small, started small, grown, and still grow. There have been, will, there are, and there will be efforts in the future to destroy it, but it will survive. It has, it will. What a day. So the church was established to consummate the new covenant. God had done his part. He provided the way for us. He had done his part. His prophecies and his promises had come into fruition. What a day. Obedient believers were given the opportunity to become partakers of that new covenant. An avenue that was open to them that had never been opened before. Uh, again, we, we go back to, uh, to Acts and we look at 2, you know, that's familiar, verse 2, 38. But Peter said to them, repent and let each one of you be baptized into the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. 3,000 souls added on that day. They didn't join, they were added to the church. They were to repent and be immersed, to have their sins forgiven and receive the Holy Spirit. They had to do their part. He had done his part. They have to do, they have to do their part. And we have to do our part today. And it didn't just stop with them on that day. They were sent into the world. They did a pretty good job uh, of, uh, uh, of growing the church in Jerusalem. But uh, what did he tell them? That it would 
be into the remotest parts of the world. And they were still, they were pretty content to hang around Jerusalem and Judea. But he had other plans. And they were, the, the process began, and they were chased out of Jerusalem. And they started going into that, those remotest parts. On that day, they also received the help that we've mentioned above, which was the indwelling spirit. Sometimes we don't appreciate the significance of the spirit of Jesus Christ living within us. What a day. He gave that gift. How important is the Spirit? Galatians 5.16 says, we're to walk by the Spirit. But I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. Walk by the Spirit. That Spirit that He has provided for us to dwell within us to help us through the difficulties of life, to have shared the joys of life, that we are to utilize as a gift from God to help us overcome our daily obstacles. So we're to walk by the Spirit. The Spirit is to produce His fruit in our lives. Uh, a few verses down. Uh, John, uh, excuse me, uh, Galatians 5, 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with his passions and desires. And we ought to do what? We ought to grow the fruits in our lives. There are some of those that come sort of natural for some people. Others come natural for others. But I dare say none of them come natural for all of us. We have to work on that. Peter says that we are to do what? We are to add to. And we are to develop all of those qualities in our lives. Why? Because we belong to him. We have made a commitment to Him that we're going to live for Him. Because we're going to be a part of His kingdom. And He has sent that Spirit, into our own Spirit, to help us along the way. I, I, I recall a few years ago, uh, UVA had a basketball player that had tattooed on his arm 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. That was strange. It was pretty amazing every time you went out to block a shot or, or a free throw, you saw that uh, on, his, uh, on his arm. He says, Oh, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, that you are not your own? You have been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. But he says that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, I mean, the dwelling place of the Spirit. Christ in us. Remember, we can stand before him as though we never sinned. And also remember that whatever you subject your body to, you subject Jesus to. Because he's living within you. The indwelling spirit. He is active in the new birth. John 3, 5. Jesus said, so truly, truly, I said to you, unless one is born of the water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So the Spirit it is active in our becoming a Christian. The Spirit is to strengthen the inner man. Ephesians 3.16 
I, let's start with the uh, fourth one. For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power through the Spirit in the inner man. So that indwelling Spirit, we're to walk by the Spirit. The Spirit is food in our lives. He's active in the new birth and he is the strengthened the inner man. Things that the new covenant made possible. And, and these are things that we're aware of, but we need reminds. Paul said, hey, I don't mind reminding you of the same thing again and again, because sometimes we forget. Things that the new covenant made possible. We receive the life that the Spirit gives. Uh, 2 Corinthians. Corinthians chapter 3. Verses 5 and 6. Not that we are adequate in ourselves to consider that uh, anything is coming from ourselves, but our adequacy is from God, who also made us adequate as servants of a new covenant. Not of the letter, meaning the law, but of the Spirit. For the letter or law kills, but the Spirit gives life. We're to walk by the Spirit because it gives life. Things that Jesus' new covenant made possible, that Christians are a new creation. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old have passed away. The whole new things have come. We are a new Christian. We're not just a slight revision of the old person. We are new. We are born in Jesus Christ. When we are immersed into baptism and we arise out of the, uh, out of the baptism, we are born again. A new person. Praise God. What a day. What a day. We're not a revision of the old, but we're new. We stand before God again as though we never sinned. We keep seeking the things of God. Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, if you've been raised up with Christ, seek. Keep seeking the things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on this earth. And the Holy Spirit, indwelling Spirit, helps us to set our mind on the things above. When we encounter obstacles, don't listen to the world outside, listen to the Spirit within. Pray to Him. Pray that He will, what will help us. Utilize you will be tempted. I, I don't know what age you quit being tempted. I haven't reached it yet. I'm getting a few years on me. But I haven't reached the age that I'm not tempted. But you know what? When you're tempted, zero in on the spiritual things. Zero in on the fact that you have the indwelling spirit living within you. Seek advice from him. Utilize that Holy Spirit. It's there. Don't waste it. Utilize it. The Christian is to make things of his earthly body dead. Excuse me. <coughs> Excuse me, 3, 5 through 8. Therefore, consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, greed, which amounts to idolatry. For it is because of these things that the wrath of God will come upon the sons of disobedience. And in them you also once walked when you were living in them. But now 
also put them aside, all anger, wrath, malice, slander, abusive speech out of your mouth. He doesn't say just do less of it. He said, kill it. Put it aside. It's not to be a part of your life anymore. <coughs> that doesn't happen immediately. But as we grow the fruits of the Spirit and the other qualities that he talks about, it will, it will happen. But he said, you're to be dead to those things. The Spirit helps you do that. Living in the Spirit. We are to renew our minds. Romans chapter 12. This is one and two. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Renew our minds. That's a daily renewal. That's not a one time. That's something that we work on day by day. It requires work. I had a friend tell me one time that he didn't believe it. that prison was necessary to, to become a Christian because it was a work. And I said, well, what about repentance? He said, well, that's not a work. I said, man, you don't understand repentance. You don't have any idea what repentance is if you say it's not work. Because it is. And it's work that starts when we become a Christian. And every day it requires us to work at it. Why? Because that's the plan God shows you. Seek the good, acceptable, and perfect. Pray that we seek the Spirit. We can overcome. Jesus overcame. We can overcome. 1 John chapter 5, verse 4. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. We can overcome. There's nothing that can overcome us. Darkness can't overcome light. One little flicker of light will overcome darkness. And we start off as a flicker, but we grow into a full flesh. We can overcome. Now, things that Jesus enables the Christian to become. You're a saint. You're a saint if you're a Christian. Christians are saints. First Corinthians chapter one. And many of the letters uh, start off this way, but I think this one does uh, uh, it is special. First Corinthians chapter one, verses uh, one and two, but especially two. Paul, an apostle of, uh, of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and Sophonies, our brother, to the church of God, which is at Corinth to those who have been sanctified in Christ Jesus. Saints by calling with all who are in every place all on the name of the Lord of Jesus Christ. The Lord and God. Saints by calling. That's who we are. I, I've heard people say to me, well, I, I'm just a son of saved by grace. And you were a son of you have been saved by grace. But you if you continue to live your life thinking, I can't do any better than this, I, I'm going to sin, so I'll just rely on God's grace. The more I sin, the more grace he bestows upon me. Now, it doesn't work that way. 
We are not sinners saved by grace. We have sinned and we are saved by grace, but we're saints. We have overcome or in the process of overcoming sin. And we are to strive to be better every day. Seeking the things above, not the things of this earth. If we have that attitude that I'm just a sinner saved by grace, we're saying, hey, let the things of the earth, they've got control over them. Now, we have control over that. You're a Christian. Again, you've been saved by grace, but you're now saint, striving to become more Christ-like every day. Remember, we can stand before God as though we never sinned. Not that we never sinned, but as though we never sinned. What are they? That we can do that. We're not aliens, but we're saints. With the fellow saints, the fellow Christians in God's house. Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians 2, verses 19 through 22. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints. Fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household, having been built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the, the cornerstone in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you are being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. That's who you are. That's who we are. Saints. Not aliens. Saints with fellow Christians. Saints can understand God's love. Ephesians 3 16 For this reason I bow my knees before the Father from whom every family on heaven and on earth, in heaven and on earth derives its name that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith and that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all of the saints what is the height and breadth and length and, de uh, and depth, and to know the love of Christ Jesus that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled up with all of the uh, fullness in him. Now, to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus for all generations forever and ever. Saints can understand God's love. He's to be glorified through the saints. Uh, 2 Thessalonians uh, 2 Thessalonians uh, Chapter 1, verses 10 through 12. When he comes to be glorified in his saints on that day and to be marveled at among those who have believed, for our testimony you was believed. To this end, we also pray for you always that our God will count you worthy of your calling and fulfill every desire of goodness and your work of faith in your power. So that the name of our Lord Jesus will be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are glorified with his saints, as his saints, be ready for glorification. Finally, we are priests in his royal priesthood. First Peter 2, excuse me, uh, yes, First Peter 2, uh, chapter 9. Uh, personal. For you are a chosen race, a royal priest, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession.
so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of the darkness and into his marvelous light. For you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. We're priests. We're saints. We're priests. We have a direct relationship with God. Praise God. What a day. What a day. I've had people through. On more than one occasion, it really surprised me, but I've had, had people, uh, uh, in people in the church, to ask me to pray for them. They said, because for you, it's a local call. For me, it's long distance. <laughs> Friend, if you're a Christian, you're a saint, and it's a local call for all. I remember, I think I can remember back that far, the days of the landline where it was a long distance call to call somebody uh, uh, out of your district. Now we have the cell phones where it's not for I guess if you call out of the states it is. But uh, we have direct access to God. You don't need to go through me. You go through Jesus. You're as close to God as I am. Because we are saints and we are priests. It's not a long distance. Why? Because he lives within you. He is overcome. We can overcome when we zero in on the things that Jesus made possible through the ascension, that he made possible through his glorification, that he has made possible through the new covenant, and he's enabled us to become so much. Let's go back to Acts chapter 1. Can you imagine that I almost tell I won't try to go back in the throat of the gospel, but how big their eyes got. Here they're talking to Jesus all of a sudden. There are two men in white robes said. Men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you to heaven, will come just the same way as you've watched him go. And they returned to Jerusalem from the Mount of Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, the Sabbath day church. When they entered the city, they went to the upper room, and they did what? They started to work. They didn't know what was going to be happening to them, but they were preparing themselves for what was going to happen. They didn't even have a date for it. He said, pretty soon. And they were ready. They quit looking into the sky and went to seek and to do the Lord's will. Do these things and you will be part of the greatest homecoming of all time. And you can take your place in heaven that he has gone prepare for you. Father, we praise you for the new creation. We praise you, Father, that, that we're not just a revision of the old man, but that we are a new creature, clothed in you, having you living within us. Father, help us see the significance of, uh, of the ascension, the glorification of the new covenant, and what we can do through you. Utilize your spirit lives within us in the daily places. He sings the rest in Jesus' name. Amen. What a day it's going to be. When we stand and hear, well done, good and faithful servant. And that begins with the decision that we make in giving our life to Christ. If you have never done that, repented of your sins, been baptized into him, then we're going to give you the opportunity to do that. We're going to stand together and we're going to sing a song of invitation. If you have a decision to make, would you do that as we stand and sing this song?
what a day it has been, but it's not over yet. And we encourage you to, uh, when we're done here in just a moment, to, to make your way over to the gym and join us for lunch and time of fellowship there. And we are, we're excited about being able to renew old acquaintances and make new friends. And we, we just want you to be a part of that. So I encourage you to join us in that. Let's join together in prayer as we close. And I'll bless our time there. Father, we, we are so grateful for the opportunity we've had to, to come together, uh, come home for some and, and come over to, to meet new friends and renew old acquaintances. And we just uh, pray that you would bless our, our fellowship as we go from here, bless uh, the lunch, the, the food, and uh, that it would nourish our bodies. Lord, I pray that, uh, that through our time today that we have been drawn closer to you and to each other that when we go from here, we can share your love with those around us who don't know the hope of Christ. And we pray these things in his name. Amen.